Welcome back to the Flat Tire, everyone. Uh, my name is Keishan Sondergaard. Today, we don't have Brandon, and Claire, unfortunately, is not here because it is a weekday, and they have real-life jobs, and we don't, unfortunately. <laughs> or fortunately, I don't know. Yeah, it depends uh, how you look at yeah. it. <laughs> and um, today, we're actually guested with... Guested is <laughs> 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 Guest it works. We can co it. It can be a new thing. Yeah, okay. Today we're guested with uh, <laughs> this awesome person, Erica Hoffman. She's a race car driver. She works in the media industry a little bit. And I don't know if that's correct. Is that correct? A little bit. Like, I do okay. a bit of photography and social media stuff for different race teams and such. That's awesome. So, mm -hmm. um, and today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, those adventures, her adventure with Formula Woman, uh, FIA Rally Stars, which just happened about a month ago, mm -hmm. and just some of the cool adventures and uh, automotive experiences she has had. So, um, Erica, I feel like I that introduction didn't really uh, explain exactly what you do. So, mm -hmm. why don't you tell us what you do? Um, right. So right now I am a race car driver, um, which is kind of cool to say as like I've made a lot of uh, developments and progress within my career versus just starting lapping a few years ago and now being able to um, actually have raced with very professional teams. I raced in uh, Europe last season and I just got back from representing Canada at the FIA Rally Stars competition, which was super cool. Uh, I got selected by Women in Motorsports Canada and the ASN and FIA also like were involved in that decision and I got to go represent Canada. Um, so I do racing stuff and then also I work for race teams because unfortunately I'm not pro enough to make a good salary just for racing cars. So substitute that are um, with working within the industry as well. Perfect. That's that's really cool that like you're, you're able to when you're not on the track, you're still able to be a part of the team in some way or another. Mm -hmm. um, I find a lot of people that if 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 they're not able to drive, to drive, they're just kind of like, oh, I'm not going to be doing anything or anything. Mm -hmm. So it's um, it's cool to see that you're actually making use of your time off track. Um, and so like you you just said that you started lapping. So mm -hmm. what kind of lapping was that? Just like at like a little track? Was that kind of traveling a little bit as well? Or Yeah. So like if we rewind to the start of my story, I always wanted to be involved in motorsports. We watched F1 growing up watch Top Gear, those kind of things. But it just seems so far removed from my daily life. I grew up in Ottawa and I didn't know anybody who raced. I didn't know how to get into it. But I had like this like pipe dream of like one day I will get to drive cool cars and do this. Um, and my family was kind of like, that's great, Erica. I don't know how you'll be able to do that, but you know, good dreaming. Um, and then when I got my driver's license, my parents kind of hoped that would appease me and be like, okay, she's driving now, so we're all good. But pretty immediately, I was like, okay, this is cool, but like, I want to actually drive now. I don't want to just like putter along the roads. Um, and so it was my mom who actually found out about autocross through MCO, and that was my first kind of dipping into performance driving. I did that, and actually, at my first event, they give you an instructor to go with you, um, which was super cool. I ended up posting faster times than the instructor who also went in our car. So I was like, oh, I don't actually suck at this. Um, and then from there, I went to Calabogie Motorsports Park. I reached out to them. They had me out to do some driver training days. And I did the Calabogie Challenge race series. So it's kind of like lapping slash racing. And I did that in my street BRZ. So I have a Subaru BRZ. I just put better tires on it, better brakes and went and drove that, um, which was fun. Also, like I didn't want to hurt it too bad because I was like, this is my only car. If I like <laughs> damage this car in any way, I'm taking the bus. So I did that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, started getting more involved in the industry, starting to know more people within the track world here in Ontario. Um, and then I heard about Formula Woman, which was a competition geared toward non-professional female drivers. And I was like, that is the competition for me. <laughs> that's, that's sweet. So before we get into, uh, into Formula Woman, let's just back up a tiny bit. So autocross is parking lot racing in, in a way. It's a yeah. timed segment racing if you want to call it that exactly um, and what car did you start with a hyundai accent <laughs> so i remember i remember my first time going to autocross to take photos mm -hmm. there was this little green accent <laughs> whipping around the track I'm like oh it's going pretty fast but i didn't really want to take photos of it because it's a green it accent it doesn't look super cool it was it was kind of ugly yeah. i had one and it was orange and one it was time, very ugly i remember one time we were street racing not legitimately street racing i'm highly against that but we were like 
um, what would you call it? Like stoplight like racing? Like we did like a zero meter dash. To, <laughs> yeah, I mean it was a very slow hundred meter dash, but we got like <laughs> zero to like speed limit. Yeah, and like it was not really moving. And it was yeah, we both had Hyundai time. accents. We were at a stoplight. It was late at night. We were like, hey. Uh, we were both driving back from a car event, and we we're like, "You want to race?" <laughs> and we were both like, "Okay, well, we're not actually really racing because we're in these very yeah. low horsepower cars, so it'll yeah. be fine if we give it a bit of a go." And <laughs> it was very dramatic. <laughs> it was it was very dramatic because like these things were like, like six thousand RPM, like wah, bah, 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 bah. honestly, <laughs> when like you're in it, an hour. you yeah. feel like you're going fast. That is the yeah. one good thing. If you have a low horsepower car, you're less caught out. You know, you can actually drive it more to its limit and mm-hmm. feel. F- like you're having fun and enjoy driving yeah. versus if you have a really high horsepower car you're always trundling around yeah. um and you get in way more trouble because you don't feel the speed as much versus you feel the speed in a handy accent oh, yeah. if you're that going 100 shakes. you're like shaking yeah. you're like, Where are that's you what that's what like a miata is so much fun like uh mm-hmm. I, I never really thought a miata or little horsepower mm-hmm. cars could be fun because mm-hmm. uh, i mean never had like a lot of high horsepower cars but it just it's just the whole sensation like you feel like the motor shaking like the the engine mounts aren't like dampered as like a newer car would be and like everything is just like vibrating and it's, teeth are chattering and your yeah. eyeballs are like mm-hmm. it's amazing it's, and yeah. i'm such a proponent of don't wait to have like all the proper equipment before you get behind the wheel honestly you learn more in a like gutless low horsepower car it all comes down to the driver Mm -hmm. again when you're starting you don't have the capacity to deal with like a 700 horsepower car anyway um and so i find that so many times people are like intimidated to start or feel like oh but i have to have this dream car before i can bring it out to a track event or do autocross or something i'm like no just show up with whatever you have my first time at autocross hyundai accent first time on a racetrack hyundai accent and you know what? You drove the accent on at Calabogie? I did. That was my That's first sin. ever time yeah. on track. And then it ended up starting to hail. And so everyone was driving really slowly because they had nice cars. And they were like, oh, it's hailing. And there I am in my like little front wheel drive car. And I'm zipping around, passing Porsches. And I'm like, yes. But it was literally because everyone else was like, uh, we're going to let this one go. And I'm still yeah. going for it. <laughs> I feel like some of that is also just due to the fact of like, knowledge wise when you're younger you're just like you send it and you have like superhero powers you feel like it so you just want to rip through rain like i used to do it all the time <laughs> and like now that you have a little more knowledge you think you'd do the same with that hyundai accent probably better and faster but would you still have that kind of same man- mindset yeah i think like i'm i'm adventurous but i'm not reckless when it comes to my driving and i definitely build it up especially like this past year racing a mclaren like that was a big step up for me and i did not have deep enough pockets to cover if i like went crazy with it so i think my mentality with driving now is really like building it up properly and doing proper scouting laps i know we did training at izone which is a driver development place in the uk and they had us even when we were on simulators doing a very like thoughtful progression of like if this was in real life you would not go crazy right out the gate like you have to do your proper like shakedown proper processes on how to learn a new track and learn a new car Mm -hmm. so i think i have that weight of especially being in worlds with cars that i can't afford to replace and like i better do the the due diligence and do this well and i'm not just going crazy right out the gate so you went from a hyundai accent to a mclaren what, I, what? Subaru BRZ in between there. That was oh, those, those was BRZ that was in the between. stepping stone, you right. know? I mean, still, that's that's quite the jump up. That's almost two to three times the horsepower from a BRZ to a McLaren. Yes. Um, yeah. So that's wild. Um, mm. I really want to touch base on the McLaren, but I know there's a lot of beginning steps you got. Yeah. You had to take, take care of before we got there. Mm-hmm. Um, so with the Hyundai Accent, did some autocross, did some lapping. Mm-hmm. And then at that point, was it just kind of like, hey, we need to get something real drive that's a little more power and fun? Yeah. Or? Well, I actually, I took a bit of a break from driving for a few years because I have migraine problems and they got really out of control. So I couldn't do anything for a while. And then when I came back to it, once I got like um, more balanced and got that under control, I was like, okay, I still really want to go to the track. I still want to race. Um, and then I had seen the BRZ, oh, like when it debuted um, and the FRS brother sister kind of thing going on. Um, and my dad was like, Erica, you need to get this car when you get a car one day. Cause it's like, 
perfect. You can take it to the track, but also drive it on the road. It's affordable, all these things. Um, and I had wanted that car for a long time. And then when I was 20, I bought it. Um, I went and test drove a bunch of them. And then I found the one I, I wanted. As soon as I drove that one, I was like, this is it. This is my special car. I'm going to get it. Um, and then from there, reached out to the track. Um, and actually, I think it was winter when I first went back to the track. I helped at the Calabogie Winter Driving Clinic. And I was like, just like volunteering and stuff and learning more about what was going on. And then that spring is when I really got going back at the track and started lapping with my BRZ, did the Calabogi GT challenge, which these cups are the trophies of. Um, That's an awesome, so, awesome it's yeah, usable. Yeah, exactly. Nice. This is handy. Can't always drink out of trophies. So it depends, mm. but um, water. <laughs> so I did that for a summer um, in 2019 and just had so much fun. And really, that's when I started really getting more integrated with the track scene, went to a lot of uh, track nights, started working for Calabogi Motorsports Park, um, would do like their supercar experience stuff and sell people insurance and things. Nice. Um, and that's probably when we met was sometime in that summer, potentially. Yeah, it's crazy how like, you think you're like the only one who's like really interested in the sport and then you kind of get into that community and you're holy crap everyone is into it so just there's so many people that you could share stories with and kind of learn off of and it's it's crazy yeah Um, i remember feeling really like nobody else was interested in motorsports growing up none of my friends even knew what formula one was um and our family was like crazy about it but it wasn't covered at all i didn't know anybody else who was into it Mm -hmm. so finally like getting connected with the motorsports scene within ottawa i was like oh my gosh all these people are like my my people you know they're into the same thing and it's very encouraging to realize you're not on your own and also realizing there's a lot of support within that community um as much as it's like racing so you're like oh we're competing against each other when you're within that community like there's so much help so many people were really kind and like encouraged me within my journey and like want to see other people succeed so i think that's um a real benefit of the community is you have that support it's true um like growing up i never had many friends like i had my brother who loved cars Mm -hmm. he's my, my dad and my brother are the ones who kind of pushed me into it mm-hmm. unknowingly, even though they kind of regret it because now I spent all my money on it. Um, and I played a lot of Gran Turismo as a kid and I used to w- watch like just whatever on TV that had to do with cars. Mm-hmm. I remember one day my dad had BBC on TV and they had Top Gear playing and I'm like, what are these three British guys doing <laughs> destroying cars? It looks like so much fun. Mm-hmm. I want to do that. Uh, so that kind of got me into it. Mm-hmm. Um, but then when I went to school, like nobody really cared. Everyone mm-hmm. played Call of Duty or Halo and those kinds of games, like FPV shooter or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, yeah, you know, I just bought a Mazda RX-7 on Gran Turismo. They're like, I don't know what any of those words are. I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. bye. <laughs> went home and played Gran Turismo again. Just the community brings so many people together. Um, and is that kind of how you got into the bitter world of racing with the GT series at Calabogi and even some of the ice racing stuff yeah at the track. i did a, just a, a touch of ice racing with my sister and my dad and i which was super fun i have a great video of my sister driving by and then noticing me filming and like throwing up a shaka as she's like driving one-handed i'm like focus on the race um <laughs> but yeah uh it was cool to like really get more used to the community get more involved in the community and see what was going on i ended up working for spc which is the super production challenge which is a local canadian racing series and then through apex that i was working for at the time i learned about formula woman which then really like kind of jumped me a few steps up in my pursuit of racing because i always wanted to pursue racing but as we all know it's very expensive and difficult to fund no oh, yeah mm-hmm. it is it is quite pricey uh like buying the car buying the safety gear i'm in the process of buying safety gear and that alone is scary yeah because like the helmet is a couple of grand if mm-hmm. needed uh your safety suit your gloves it comes down to like underwear too and i didn't know that like to be <laughs> yeah, honest i'm like fire i need underwear and socks like yeah fireproof socks crazy the thing is like and then they only give you like what like three seconds of burn time each like layer or whatever and you're like i'm spending thousands of dollars to give me an extra three seconds <laughs> yeah. but i guess you really want those three seconds and you want it to yeah. it adds up you layer yourself mm-hmm. you know yeah and like that is my great-grandmother's clock. 
Whoa, that is creepy. <laughs> it's actually kind of cute, but... I mean, I guess from a day, when you don't but know what like, it is... Like, it's... <laughs> yeah, like, for this ominous ringing is yeah. creepy. I get yeah. that. It's nice. Cool. I'll look at it later. Okay. Um, so I don't feel creeped out. <laughs> It's um, small. It's oh. weird that it sounds a lot. Anyway, continue. Cool. Anyway, safety gear, underwear, socks. Weird. Um, mm. Yeah, it all it all adds up. Mm. And so, how did you actually get in in like kind of the realm of driving those like higher caliber cars, mm -hmm. like with Formula Woman or like what's what is Formula Woman actually? Um, so Formula Woman is a competition that was geared towards amateur female drivers. So you couldn't be a professional driver to enter. And the thought process is motorsports is really expensive. There's a lot of barriers that prevent people from being able to be involved. But if you look at the percentage of people who let's say play soccer versus the percentage of people who race cars. It's a very small amount race cars. There's like there's a lot of people out there. There's probably a lot of people who have potential. Who has the right building blocks that we could kind of find the best potential to make into successful race racing drivers? So they evaluated us on obviously our driving. We did karting and driving like track cars and race cars, um, sim driving mental tests. We had a sports psychologist do all these different tests on us and a lot of our ability to learn a lot of uh, how's our mindset when it comes to dealing with failure or like competitive things all these things they compared us with world champions in across the board in a bunch of different sports like do we share similar characteristics to other people who have been successful globally um, we did like mechanical tests on like what's your knowledge of cars on racecraft all those kind of things um, I did my first first like intake into the program in the fall of 2021 and Keishan was actually there and helped me film I had to film like an intro video because media is also another part oh of God, it I remember that yeah that was a struggle I've, was I've a struggle. progressed a little bit my ability to talk on camera but obviously if you're going to be a race car driver you have to deal with the media you have to deal with sponsors you have to be able to perform on camera all these things and I was very awkward at talking on camera and yeah. Keishan spent a whole day with me at the go-kart track yeah that was um that was uh interesting because it was a very busy day. I remember that. It was warm out. Mm -hmm. And there was just so many different setbacks to, to get the things going. But whatever. It, it worked out. Yeah. And the video was awesome. And you got into Formula Woman. Exactly. And it so was, that was, that was thank cool. you very much. But Keisha, an integral part in getting me behind the wheel of a sports car. It was all so me. I you. did all the work. <laughs> I didn't. I did all the, the, the filming. I was driving in europe and everything yeah, was me every step of the way yeah um but yeah so after all this they ended up taking the top 75 from these different intakes around the world most of which were from the uk a lot of people went over to europe to do it because formula women's founded in the united kingdom um and then we had the finals which was a multi-round process so we started off go-karting we had two days at pfi which is a, a go-kart track in the uk we did again more tests more physicals all those kind of things they narrowed us down and at this point was kind of like my low point in my self-belief in my journey of formula woman because i was like there's so many girls here how are they going to know how good am i compared to them um and there was just a lot of people who had a um a lot more experience than i did i'd come from no go-karting background no real racing had come from lapping um and i was kind of doubting myself there were these girls with like youtube channels and all these girls who had done a bunch of stuff within formula woman already because they had training days and different things like that so mm. i was like ah oh, no like uh, and then we were racing in the rain on like slick tires and everyone was spinning out and I was like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. What were you racing in the rain? Is that oh, like, like carts or? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. I mean, carts in the rain are always so much fun though. <laughs> it was it's... fun, but there was a lot of pressure and yeah. there was a lot riding on the single cart race. So I was like, okay. my goodness. So, so I'm just going to, cause we, there are a lot of factors going into like Formula Woman. Mm -hmm. It's, it sounds a lot more intricate than I thought it was. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought it was just like an application process and you kind of like picked out a pool and then mm -hmm. you do some driving and then yeah, that's your, mm -hmm. you're going in. So I have so many questions about like the mental capabilities, the mm -hmm. racecraft thing, um, even like physical capabilities. So like, what are, how do those tie into actually racing? Yeah, so again, pretty much the turnover between the end of the competition and when we needed to be in the car mm. was pretty short. So they're like, you have to already be in, in good physical shape. We were doing endurance races as the prize. So, and it can be quite exhausting to drive a race car. I know when I was a kid, I was always like, 
hey, you're just driving a car, you know, like you're yeah. not, I don't know why I was Southern as a child yeah, right I don't there, know. There you go. but um, <laughs> you're just driving a car around. Like it's the car, which everyone's fastest is going to win. But as we yeah. know, within racing, it's, it really comes down to the driver. Yeah. And like, there's not a lot of comfortable aids when you're driving a race car. They're pretty stripped out. Um, I'm super lucky. The McLaren had air conditioning, which was really nice. Yeah, um, and I know. And normally if you have AC, you don't run it because you're, taking some power away from the engine but the way that the the mclaren was programmed was because it knew it was going to take power away and it's limited um the 570s so they added in a bit more they added in like a bit more they overrode it i'm trying to explain it simply but i'm not doing a good job but um pretty much when you play when you use the air conditioning it actually gives you more power than it drains from the engine because so the mapping like, of the ec changes exactly a okay, yeah cool. so they put this you get like a little bit more power. So they're like, run a, a AC, run it full power the whole time. You can point it away from yourself if you want, but you want that extra like slight margins because it's all, That's you know, cool. slight margins. So yeah. super lucky as someone who loves air conditioning and who has that migraine problem and can get car sick. I like to have full power on my face. I also would take Advil and gravel, not the sleepy kind, just the normal ginger gravel before I would race because you have to do so much work warming up your tires and I could really see a difference. If you were committed to warming up your tires and really like had them hot off the start, you could really make progress mm -hmm. versus cars who are just like non-committed weaving to warm up their tires. So you want to do it, but you make yourself so sick, mm -hmm. like aggressively braking and aggressively weaving. Um, but anyway, I digress. Um, but yeah, race cars are not the most comfortable vehicles, super hot. It's all about performance. It's not about comfort and it's really physically demanding. Actually, once you get into it and GT racing is not quite as bad, but as you go up and depends on the different car you're in. Okay. Um, I was in one race once where I didn't get belted in properly and then I needed, it was a complicated story, but pretty much I didn't get belted in properly and there had been an incident earlier in the race so the car wasn't tracking straight so I couldn't, I could take one hand off to try to do my belts but I couldn't take both hands off very oh, well. The yeah, and I needed okay. to, like, it wouldn't go straight <laughs> so I had to hold it, uh, so I couldn't on the straight take both my hands off and tighten my belt so I couldn't get them tight enough and then with the cornering velocity and everything I ended up like throwing out my neck with like a few laps Ooh. left yeah. and I felt so sick I was like I'm gonna vomit while driving just because of the pressure and again I'm in GT racing so nothing compared to the formula and all those kind of things but it still definitely takes a toll on your body so they want you to be able to be fit um agile also you want to be lightweight doesn't matter quite as much in in GT racing in terms compared to formula racing but again you don't want to have extra weight in the car if possible so fitness was important also just it's so hot in the car so you want to make sure that you can if you're fit you can kind of focus a bit better versus mm -hmm. it taking as much of a toll on you um in addition to that they did like all these mental performance tests and we actually had a sports psychologist work with us as we started our season and everything and just the proper mindset to be a winner and to be a champion and how okay. you have to have like the proper self-belief and especially going into our season there was a lot of people who were kind of questioning why we were there like okay these are random girls who don't have a ton of experience like there was a lot of naysayers at the same time um even though we did have support from other people there was still a lot of like eh, i don't know how these girls going to do and stuff like that. So having that self-belief and knowing like, no, I deserve to be here and not mm -hmm. being pushed around on the track. And thankfully, once we actually after our first race and we performed well, that a lot of that kind of faded more into the background. It was a lot of a big build up before we raced. And then after we raced and we showed we were on pace, we could deliver. Then That's people cool. were like, oh, OK, and kind of like we're then a lot more for us. But you have to have a lot of confidence in your own abilities and not let that be hung upon what other people think of you. So a lot of those kind of psychology bits. So even though we had training in that, they had to be like, okay, you have to be like close or you have to have proper mindset going into it. You have to be able to deal with stress well. You have to be able to process things quickly. There was mental speed tests and then there was like, how do you deal with adversity? And I don't even know how they learned all of that from us, but <laughs> <laughs> we had tons of tests and I remember our first meeting with our sports psychologist and she was like reading my results and like explaining myself to me and I was like how do you know all these things about me you know <laughs> it's but, black magic yeah that's 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 I mean it all makes a lot of sense when you explain it like that mm -hmm. um just someone who hasn't done professional racing yet 
It's just, it's cool to know these things before kind of going into it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I guess all of these things you learned and kind of saw behind the scenes, this is all helped you progress better and quicker as a driver? Yeah. So again, there was that my that, sorry, I don't know. So again, there was that whole, okay, you have to be, go from zero to 100 really quick. We have to get you up to pace. You have way less time, way less actual seat time as well. We didn't have a ton of time in the car to prepare. Um, so we had to make sure we were in the proper mindset and doing everything you can behind the scenes mm-hmm. to make that seat time that you did get as valuable as it could be. So um, for me, like I definitely think simulators are really helpful in terms of learning a track, getting you prepared to make the most of your on-track time. Um, so we did work on simulators. We did all those kind of things so that you could, when you did get that seat time, you were best prepared for it as you could be and then you could capitalize on it the most that's cool that's actually interesting that like that you said that like i've uh, i've chatted with a few people who've never driven on specific tracks mm-hmm. uh like the gears and gasoline guys they mm-hmm. did a little bit of like a sim racing stuff with uh with mark and, and apex and then when we went to calabogie to drive it for their first time ever they were like holy crap we know this track already this is already like what we've played with i've done that myself too so first time ever driving on montreal Bois circuit I was like, hey, I've never driven this track before. I want to make the best of it, the mm-hmm. first experience ever going. How do I do it? I watched a few ep- uh, episodes, a few videos on YouTube. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, I can watch other people do it. But it's not the same as just watching a video on YouTube. Like, mm-hmm. you're actually you're immersing, immersed, immersing yourself. <laughs> I can't tweet it's anymore. All good. It's all good. That was um, me at Lombardi. When we oh, started. yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, um, worse. I was way worse. I anyway, continue. I don't know. I think you were better than that. Um... <laughs> But it's different immersing yourself within the actual like system and on the track and driving it virtually. Mm-hmm. Um, then by the time I actually got there, it was so cool because like I knew exactly where the bumps were. I knew exactly where the turban was. Mm-hmm. Uh, I knew exactly where not to stop and go into the gravel that happened that one time, <laughs> which made sure to t- check your tire pressure before you go back <laughs> on track after lunch because that was sketchy. Mm, um, have you driven dip. at Montreal Blanc before? I have not. Okay, I really but, want. I've only in Canada. I've only driven Calabogie and Shannonville. Really? I know. I've driven tons of tracks in Europe, and none in Canada. Okay, so Mossboard is fun. Yeah. In a slow car, it's kind of boring because mm-hmm. on the back straight, you're trying to like changing songs, and that's what you're <laughs> supposed to. But that's what I did because nice. my car is like 100 horsepower or less. Mm-hmm. Um, so that back straight going like up the hill, and then it's like a minute. Yeah, it's very slow. Yeah. Um, but Montreal. So I don't know if you're familiar with the the track layout. A little, a little bit. bit, not a ton, but... Um, so, corner one, two, three. It's, like, mm-hmm. up the hill, going towards the right, and then okay. down the hill, and then there's, like, a... There's, a, like, a 90-degree right corner. Um, mm-hmm. So, on that 90-degree corner, yeah. um, I hit the brakes, and all four tires locked up because <laughs> I didn't check tire pressure. That's oh, that's shoot. what I think. I didn't check tire pressure, and it was overinflated at, like, 40-something mm-hmm. PSI. Yeah, the so, sun on them and everything. Yeah. Exactly. And it just instantly locked up. It was like glass. I let off the brakes and got back on the brakes. Nice. And just it just went full locked again. I was like, oh, well, I'm shoot. going into the gravel pit. <laughs> I'm looking at the marshal. And the marshal just staring at me with the flag dead in the yellow out slowly. <laughs> He's like, and I'm like, mm-hmm. <laughs> he just starts waving it. And I'm just slowly coming to a stop <laughs> in the gravel. I wave to him, turn the tire back on because I just clutched it and hit the brake and everything yeah. stalled. Um, yeah, that was that was not fun. No. Yeah, on that. But you learn you know, from experiences I learned, like yeah, that. Exactly. You, know? you gotta you gotta make mistakes in order to learn. Yeah, um, exactly. Have you made any of those kinds of like weird errors or something like on a track before that you learned of or during autocross, during lapping, or even yeah, sim training? Exactly. Yeah, there's all little things that you pick up and some things you just have to learn from experience. And for instance, okay, this is a kind of embarrassing one. I'm just gonna show you how not professional I was. <laughs> but pretty much I was racing at Silverstone and and I'd raced it on the sim before, and I'd done decently well, and um, that last corner, so if you know where the F, F1 pits are, um, so you would go off into the pits, and then there's a chicane to the straight, and in the sim, I would pass people there all the time, and it went great, and then I went to go do that in real life, and then I like got to b- along kind of beside him, and then I was like, there's no way he can see me, and I remember in the sim, I was like, oh, it's because it's like, car on your left or whatever it would say like oh my god crew chief yeah. would spot you and i was like he can't see me because again i hadn't done a ton of racecraft, so i i wasn't filling his mirrors properly all this stuff thankfully i realized as i'm there i'm like 
mm, this seems bad and I backed out of it and he turned in I was like well I would have been clobbered there and then I had like this moment being like okay recalibrate this is not the sim you don't have these like crew chief watching out over you yeah. um but then you realize like okay like I'm way out of position to pass someone and that was kind of a moment where I was like that was really dumb like why did I do that but it kind of kicked me into being like okay like I need to think through certain things differently than I have been in certain ways that you can get lulled into like patterns which are incorrect patterns but if you don't have someone stopping you or you've learned them incorrectly at the start mm -hmm. you kind of have to do them and then realize like okay that was a an error you know it's it's good I did though pass that, you, that guy eventually though nice that was, that was one of the questions uh but it's good that you caught yourself before anything bad happened mm -hmm. that's that's going 150 to 200 kilometers an hour and be able to think like that is very talented for someone oh, to do well thank you um not just you but like me myself because mm -hmm. like you know my me out gets up to 500 kilometers an hour nice, nice. just thought <laughs> um but it's it takes a lot of skill and i guess the mentality and the physicality like that all comes into play while you're doing mm -hmm. these pretty much more or less high speed chess mm -hmm. that's that's kind of how i i yeah. i take racecraft into into account is like if someone's going to go out wide like what what's your move going to be you got to mm -hmm. think two or three steps ahead yeah. of that person um, and i had a very weird like kind of dump into motorsports because obviously I'd, I'd been wanting to be a race car driver for years and years didn't have the funds was like building my way up working at race series trying to figure out stuff and then when I won the Formula Woman competition I all of a sudden was racing at a GT4 level with GT3 cars on track and that was my first time doing any wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing so my first actual passes were like let's figure this out you know um with yeah, GT3s coming through to lap you and um, battling with like R8s and different things. So all of a sudden you're dumped into the deep end. You're like, okay, let's go for it. Um, the nice thing is like a GT4 handles really well. So it does give you that confidence. Um, but all of a sudden you're like right out, out the gate. You're doing like 230 your first race and stuff. And you're like, let's go. Um, but yeah, you I learned so much each race each race was such a big progression our whole team like me and my teammate jody sloss which is one of my besties and i race with her and we would get so much better every race and you could see kind of like our first race we were in the back of the field next race we were further up our fi uh, final race weekend we're like right mixing it up like nearer to the front of the field and everything like that so it was cool to see how much you learned and it was just such a like a fire hose of information in terms of your progression and and again when you were saying like um those chess moments of like when you're racing i remember our second race weekend we were racing at Olton park and i was trying to pass this guy and i was faster than him he was also in the same car i was in he was in a mclaren 570s and i was faster than him at a few points and i think it it took me like i don't know like two or three laps to get by him or something um but that first lap I was like oh I'm faster but like it's hard to get by because you're even though you're faster it's like marginally faster so then I had to go think through like okay where am I faster how can I actually get by him and then I ended up using gt3s who are coming through and like planned it out was like okay how can I lose the least time letting these guys by and how can I maximize on they're gonna have to go by the guy I'm trying to pass um and so it was down cascades if you know Olton Park they went through and I just like stuck right with them and the guy tried to like close up after them but I was right there couldn't and like we were like drag racing and I ended up making it out and then I had this whole moment where I was like oh my gosh I'm a race car driver yeah. I was like that was so well thought out compared that's to like me like doing dumb things being like that was not a that was not a pro that, move that, honestly that, that's a super smart way of doing it because you're using them essentially as like pawns right yeah you're, you're kind of putting them into places that you don't need to be you're, mm -hmm. you're, yeah that's that's sweet no so i was like i was proud of myself for that because that was our like second race weekend and then i was going down that straight and had like a moment where i was like whoa i'm racing because i was like that was not just me that was like premeditated like multiple corners before in terms of like when am i gonna let them through yeah. then i'm gonna follow them they're gonna catch him at this point so i'm gonna pass here that kind of thing and 
it took a while like when you first get in the seat there's so much happening you don't really have the mental space to do that especially someone who hadn't raced a bunch before right but as you do it things slow down you're able to increase your bandwidth mentally on like what you can manage how much you can think ahead those kind of things and so that was the point where I was like whoa I'm doing this this is great um and really felt like okay like I do belong here especially because we had had so much negative kind of attention towards us and a lot of people doubting whether we could do perform well and everything and then being like nah like that was when I I believed for myself that I was like okay I can do this like I have way less seat time than everyone here I have way less experience Even like that race weekend, people had like four to five times the practice we had um, just because it's costly to practice. Um, And then I was like passing people and pulling off moves. And I was like, yes, I'm doing it. This is a childhood dream and it's happening. And it was really cool. And then I was like, focus, get back in the race because I had like a straight where I had like a break of focus and was like, woo. And then I was like, okay, now focus, get back in the race. Yeah, yeah, that's that's super cool. Um. And then outside of the GT4 stuff that you've done, mm-hmm. is there other racing that you've like, you kind of like planned it to do, or is there other racing that you've already done that you, mm-hmm. um, I guess what I'm trying to say is you've done rally racing, which isn't really in your wheelhouse. Mm-hmm. So what, how, how did you like start rally racing or how <laughs> did you try rally racing, even though you've never really done much dirt yeah, driving? Exactly. Well, I like to joke that my business plan when it comes to racing is I just enter competitions I'm underqualified for and somehow win them. Nice. Um, and so with rally driving, it was something I always wanted to do, especially as a kid. I thought it was just so badass. I was like, that's like the coolest thing ever. They're drifting through the forest mm-hmm. and such. Um, but I was ended up being selected by Women in Motorsports Canada. So you had to apply. They had a slot to send someone to the FIA Rally Stars competition. Um, so pretty much the FIA was hosting this competition as an initiative, kind of similar to Formula Woman in terms of finding talent who didn't have opportunity, bringing them into the sport. And it was a multi-year plan of like kind of these intakes and bringing people in, doing rally competitions and training them to, you know, rally professionally. Um, And so what I was selected for is each country had intakes um, and selection processes and then would send a representative to the continental final. So pretty much... Europe had one, Asia, Africa, South America, and North America were looped together. So we had North, Central, and South America all together for this um, final. So you had the top rally drivers in their countries. There had been different intakes, all this stuff. And I was there, and I was like, why am I here? Like, I really wanted to be there. I was super stoked about it. But I show up at the final, which took place in Italy. So shout out to the FIA. Thank you for bringing me out. Um, and thank you to Women in Motorsports Canada for trusting me and selecting me. And I think they saw my success with Formula Woman, which was a similar process. And they're like, well, if she can beat a bunch of drivers, maybe she'll do good in this. Um, and so... <laughs> I mean, that's exactly how you're taking your motorsports career. Just throwing it in. That's that's it. Um, but yeah, that's the other thing is I feel like sometimes... I, I know statistically this is a lot more prone to women, but you'll disqualify yourself from an opportunity because you don't meet 100% of the requirements. But I'm learning more and more, like, just try things. Just put yourself out there. Like, you're going to fail take the risk and you'll grow a lot in the process. And that was with Formula Woman. Again, I saw all these people who had a lot more experience than me and I was like, uh, I might not do so well, but I was like, but I'll learn a lot through the process. And same with Rally Stars. I was like, I probably won't be the fastest rally driver there because I'm not a rally driver, but it's seat time, it's learning, it's adapting, and it's such a cool opportunity. And I was so honored to get selected by Women in Motorsports to get to represent Canada. Like that's such a cool thing to do as an athlete in your sport to be able to represent your country um so we had the final in italy it was gonna happen in peru and then uruguay and then it got moved to italy so we went to italy and i show up and there's all these rally drivers there um who were all the best everyone was super nice um but they were like so what's your background i was like oh i do gt racing and they're like what and then they're like so like how much like rally do you do and i was like uh none they were like we have snow on the roads in canada (laughs) yeah well actually when i got selected i was like man why didn't i like hoon around more on the streets and drift around in the snow more Mm -hmm. um but it's okay it worked out fine um so i got there again i was like okay well 
I got nothing to lose. And in a certain perspective, it was like, okay, if we were doing GT racing, I'd put a lot more pressure on myself because I'd be like, okay, this is where I have to perform. But I was like, it's rally driving. It's different. I'm, there's no expectations on myself, which in certain ways, like the underdog has it easy in those senses. So I was like, I'm just going to learn. And everyone was super nice. Um, there's a girl, Anya, who ended up winning the entire thing. She's amazing. And she kind of took me under her wing. She's the Peruvian cross cart champion. Um, and so she taught me how to drive like verbally so pretty much we um we did a track walk and this continental final was done with cross carts and she has a lot of experience in cross carts also it was nice just to meet another woman within motorsport i think at the final there was about 15 women maybe a little bit less 15 of us in the field of like 45 or 50 people um and again it was cool to see that's a kind of high percentage of women but the fia was really trying to Obviously, this is a, like, trying to find people. So they were, like, trying to encourage women within the sport as well, which is really cool of them. Um, and so in the morning, we did a track walk. And she, like, was like, okay, with these cars, you really got to steer with throttle. She, we, like, walked around. She was like, here, it's muddy, so do this. Here, you'll have more grip, so go. And kind of talked me through it, which I'm so grateful for. And from that, I ended up performing quite well um, because I just didn't have a lot of track time beforehand and I think that's kind of indicative of a lot of my motorsports journey and a lot of people who don't have a lot of money you have to just kind of perform when you have to perform without Mm -hmm. having the ability to have a the luxury of having a ton of time to prepare Mm -hmm. um because we don't have cross cart racing really in Canada and I actually got selected to go pretty last minute and I uh, was just coming off knee surgery so I hadn't practiced at all I couldn't even drive a sim to practice because I was not doing great I like finally recovered to the point of like okay I think I can drive and then I left and I drove there so it was fine but it wasn't a lot of preparation time so hold on what what is cross cart cross cart is kind of like a dune buggy-esque thing I can show a picture we can insert a picture if you want Uh, do you know what I'm talking about I think so is that that's what you drove for the rally stars championship okay so okay yeah, they look they look like a like dune buddy, but thing. slammed on the ground. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. They're honestly so fun. I would love like if you just get a bunch of friends together and you just do cross cart racing. Yeah. Like, could you ever be sad again? Like, it's honestly <laughs> so fun, and I was having a great time um, getting to drive these things. Um, each heat or each was a minute long, so we pretty much it's a minute long track, um, and we had the first day we had two runs. And then the second day we had two runs and those were, that was it for our qualifying to like for the first section. So you, I literally had four minutes in the car to learn how to rally drive, which was a short T- learning time. Can you, can you take us through that, that like kind of process from like start to finish of like, Hey, you just got your helmet on. What's, what was, what yeah. was kind of happening? So first off I put my helmet on, I put my goggles on cause it was super muddy and we were being covered in mud. And then my goggles started fogging up because I put my balaclava too close Like, it was covering up my nose or something, and it was fogging up my glasses, my goggles, and I had to be, like, to the guy who was, like, about to make us go. I was like, I can't see. And he was like, pull your balaclava down. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. And then with these carts, you start in first. It's a sequential, like, uh, shift but not paddles, like a shifter like this. You have a clutch. You do have a handbrake, but they were like, no, we're not, you don't really need it on this course. Um, And so you... The first time you go forward to shift up, but from there you pull back to shift up. And okay. every time, I'm very dyslexic, every time I had to ask the start person was like, okay, it's forward, it's towards myself to shift up, down to shift down. And they were like, right, because I was a little worried I was going to forget halfway through. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Um, and you're pretty much just in this little like cage. Um, and then it's really short gears. You're shifting up really fast and you're really steering with throttle. You're like sliding the rear out. Um, it was really muddy. So you're trying to not get too much wheel spin or too bogged down in the mud. So our first day was really muddy. Second day it dried out and ended up being like dry and dusty. Um, so very different. Um, my first run, it was super wet. So the mud was really thick and slow. 
um, and the the pavement was clear because it had rained so much. There was really no mud on it, so you could pretty much like you had a lot of traction on the pavement. Versus my second run, it had stopped raining. The mud was a little less thick, but I'd been like now dragged over the pavement, so the pavement wasn't grippy anymore. So you're just always adjusting to like where can you push those kind of things. Um, and a lot of people were spinning out because obviously you have such a short amount of time to make your qualifying time, right? So you had to be quick. So I was like, okay, let's just like stay calm. Um, and my mentality was kind of similar to my, one of my mentalities I had in the Formula Woman final. We had a, after the PFI thing, we ended up going to Croft Circuit and we had one lap shootout in a Jag to like set the, the and then the, sorry, set our qualifying time, and then the top 10 moved on to the final. Um, and I was at a circuit I didn't know, in a car I didn't know, in conditions that were wet, and I didn't know where the grip was going to be or anything. Um, and in those situations, I find you just have to let let kind of that pressure go and be like, okay, like I can only drive as good as I can drive. Mm -hmm. I can't all of a sudden hope to have all this immense ability and knowledge that you can only have once you've actually driven it and practiced it and stuff. So you're just driving off feel and just kind of enjoy it is my thought process is like, okay, I can't make myself better by stressing myself out. I need to relax, drive by feel. I drive better when I'm not too tense because I'm someone who always puts more pre too much pressure on myself. So my thing is I always have to let pressure go. I'm not someone who's like chill and needs to like get in the zone. I'm someone who's right. like too hyped up and I need to like calm down. Yeah. Um, and then when I'm more relaxed, I drive better. You can feel the car better. And also you just like enjoying it. And the thing is I... As someone who's wanted this for so long, like since my childhood, always wanted to drive, didn't have very many opportunities, and you don't know how long these opportunities will last, I'm really pro, like, take a moment and appreciate where you are and enjoy getting to be in the car because, mm -hmm. like, I don't know how long it's going to last. I don't know if I get to race again, and if I'm so stressed out, which is something I'll do to myself, um, that I don't enjoy the experience, then why am I doing it? Why am I putting, killing myself, doing all this work to get myself in a car to then stress myself out and not enjoy getting to drive the car? Right. So I try to enjoy it, try to kind of loosen up. And honestly, at FA Rally Stars, that's really, I did an excellent job of that <laughs> um, in terms of, it was also set up for me well because I, I wasn't expected to do well. Um, but I was like, just enjoy it, feel it. And there's only so much mental preparation you can do when it's so many unknowns mm -hmm. so I was like okay shift fast there was like a few key things I wanted to keep in my brain but aside from that I was like you just gotta feel it and go and then I drove and I was like this is the funnest thing yeah. ever it's <laughs> so sick yeah. um and so each round I did I just like I knew as soon as I finished it I was like okay I want to clean this part up or I want to be better at this the shifting was a big thing I wanted to shift faster um just because like you're so not used to that coming from GT cars it was like do 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 you're like what why am I shifting yeah. every four seconds not even that, like, that was second. a really fun like feeling though it's mm -hmm. like you're you everything's open almost like formula style but mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. it's very like grassrootsy I, yeah. i'd assume we had like little yeah. like goggles that you'd wear if you were like doing a science experiment in class and we we're like Shit. strapping these on that, that sounds like a lot of fun mm -hmm. um and then for the actual race this was all side by side like wheel to wheel racing no or was it, it was more just of a time, time trial so then okay. i made the semifinals, which was super cool and everyone was so excited for me which was really sweet they were yeah. like oh you don't know what you're doing and yeah. you did so good good job <laughs> um so i made the semis and then we had i think six lap we did um longer runs so you wouldn't just do one run you would go multiple laps and it would be your okay. accumulative time okay. um and that was super fun it was honestly that was exhausting too like i think it's also part of the adrenaline that's going on in that high pressure situation but driving a cross cart kudos to people who do that a lot because it is quite tiring yeah. i like got out of the car and i was like oh my gosh i need to work out more <laughs> um but yeah it was super fun and then they took the top 10 times which i did not make the top 10 for like the final um but i was the third fastest woman in all of north and south america and i made the semis beat a bunch of people and so i was like you know what i'm proud of that and everyone who was in the top 10 were like guys who had been rallying for ages actually not everyone there was a canadian guy who was a sim racer who made it in That's shout cool. out to storm he did a fantastic job hmm. um we also hung out a lot of like the north uh, us and the americans because 
we didn't speak Spanish very well. So as much as everyone was really kind and like translating for us all the time, sometimes we would just hang out with the Canadians and the Americans and be like, English. That's fair. Mm-hmm. Um, like it's that's that's a weird that's a cool experience because you're just getting thrown into something you don't know. Mm-hmm. So you're you're not only just competing but you're also learning. Mm-hmm. at the same time which is just a lot of mental toll yeah um no that's, i learned so cool. much i bet mm-hmm. um and then so women in motorsports is like a, a the same thing as like formula woman like what what is what is that um so yeah so women in motorsports canada is a division of the fia so the fia has a div- has like representatives in different countries that are just pro women in motorsports so helping getting people a seat at the table so our head is leanne and she is fantastic she's a rally driver so she's a co-driver and um she comes from that whole background so it was also cool for me to step into her rally world a little bit um and they have a whole team of volunteers they just did stuff at the canadian grand prix they're doing stuff at toronto indy and they're really just trying to open opportunities for young girls to get involved in the sport um, and just make it more accessible because I think there's a lot of young women and older women as well but young girls who don't really see a seat at the table like they want to be involved but they're like kind of intimidated it's mainly guys and it's mainly people who are much older than them so just kind of creating a window like no you belong here as well and I think that helps the whole sport um, grow because diversity always helps because you have different people who come with different perspectives who help encourage the whole. If you only ever have like old white men in charge of everything, you have a great perspective of old white men, but you don't have like a <laughs> complimenting perspective. Maybe we cut that out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, it just sounded weird the way you. Yeah, was, yeah, but yeah, what we'll, I'm trying we'll to say it. is, I'm not trying to devalue anyone's opinion, but yeah. when you have. Uh, other people, people come at problems differently. Like men and women think differently. Mm -hmm. If you grew up in different places, you think differently. If you like, even like from different family perspectives. And I find that that's how you really problem solve well or uh, allow growth in an industry is when you have different perspectives coming together. Cause then you can really like look at a problem from different angles and problem solve it. That's true. Like when I, when I first started getting into, into motorsports and car stuff, like there wasn't a whole lot of people like me who mm-hmm. was like younger and a colored dude, mm-hmm. um, and it was weird because like there was no one, no one else really like who I really connected connected with, mm-hmm. right? Uh, even though like everyone was always like very open, and if, if I ever had a question, like they answered it, mm-hmm. uh, not in Spanish but in English, <laughs> nice. so it was very different. Because <laughs> so I remember like years ago, mm-hmm. you wanted to do stunt driving. Is that yes. still something that you're trying to? pursue or is kind of the motorsports section Um, of uh, of your life kind of taken over yeah as of late like motorsports has definitely the past few years taken a a front seat but i really do want to get into stunt driving stunt driving something that i think is so cool it's also a way to make a bit of money in comparison to racing doesn't always pay you a ton of money um so yeah i started off doing some stunt driving stuff um a few years ago i went down to the states learned how to like drift parallel park and that kind of thing which is actually easier than you might think um but it will wreck your brakes if you do not have good brakes on your car or if you have good brakes on your car so sorry parallel park drift so you have two cars like yeah one in front of the other and then you came in just and slide in in. yeah if you have drum brakes on your car super easy if you, really? Yeah. Like, well, because you just lock them up and then you just slide in where you want to go. Okay. But if you have disc brakes, you're going to kind of hurt them a little bit. So I don't okay. really practice much. But um, that's, that's something I really want to get into. Also, it's just more precision precision, dri- precision driving. Um, and it just takes, like, it's a different facet of the world of driving. And uh, you still have to, there's still pressure in it in terms of, like, okay, if you're on set, like, you have to get it right. Like, mm-hmm. you're hired to do this job. You got to do it right. Especially if you're in big your productions like every if you're messing up a bunch like yeah it's a lot of money on like especially if you got explosives and pyrotechnics involved yeah so it's yeah yeah, it's such a skill set but i think it's so cool and i've really been wanting to get involved in it um i actually started doing like muay thai and stuff like that to round out because normally you can't just get into doing stunt driving people are like oh you have to have more of a stunt background um but then once you're more specialized then you can get into it um and now thankfully with my motorsports background and stuff getting 
bigger and bigger. Hopefully I can leverage that into it more. But if you ever need a stunt driver, let me know. Um, and it's also cool because there's a lot more film happening in Canada these days. Yep. Um, so there's more opportunities there, whereas okay. there isn't a huge amount of racing within Canada. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it is getting bigger, though, like the whole like motorsports in mm -hmm. Canada thing. Um, like Ref TV has been like really kind of pushing to uh, to kind of showcase some of the mm -hmm. Canadian stuff because it's a Canadian only TV channel if I'm not mistaken mm -hmm. that does a lot of that motorsport stuff um, like Mossport has like a crap ton of events happening mm -hmm. now this year Caleb is really like kind of pumping out a lot more uh, track days for like novices track days for uh, intermediate drivers mm -hmm. and if I'm not mistaken there's a uh, um, there's a summer classic, which I don't know if they're bringing Porsche Cup Canada to. I think they used to in the past, That'd but I'm sick. not. I'm not too sure if they are this year. Mm -hmm. That would be really cool to mm -hmm. see, because Calabogie is a sick track. You know it yourself. Mm -hmm. It's it's awesome, and um, I think I think the more more people in Canada get involved in motorsports, the, just the bigger it's going to get. Yeah, um, no, I've yeah. even seen there's such a growth even within the last few years. And if you think about like when I was a kid and I talk about motorsport, people were like, well, it's Formula One versus now, especially through Netflix and Drive to Survive and it just becoming way more mainstream. Mm -hmm. So many people are like, whoa, this is sick. This is yeah. so cool. So really seeing it grow and then having organizations like Calabogie Motorsports Park, which is able to help funnel people into the sport, because I think that was a, a disconnect within Canadian motorsport and Canadian track culture is like people would be like, that's so cool, but, like, how do I do it, you know? And there seems to be, it's just less accessible than, like, joining a baseball team or something. Mm -hmm. um, but now there there definitely are avenues for people to get involved and really, like, speaking as someone who started just, like, trying to get involved and then ended up racing GT4 in Europe, like, you never yeah. know where it could take you and you just have to be, you know prepared and do as much as you can to put yourself in a good position for when there are opportunities mm -hmm. and like i think i think i think some advice uh, that i would give is like like volunteer at the track volunteer in uh sports clubs um mm -hmm. like either if it's like like physical sports like uh, baseball and all that kind of stuff to like get your you know physical peak up but also like in sports car clubs mm -hmm. like volunteer spend some time at the track get to know people mm -hmm. um if if i were like a uh, that's a weird thing to say. If I was a girl looking to get into motorsports, what would be some advice you would give me? Um, first off, I would just encourage you to do it. I feel like there's sometimes a lot of apprehension or a lot of like, I don't know where I belong or where I fit. Um, mm -hmm. Especially like when I started coming to the track a few years ago, when I showed up, I didn't see any other girls. Like I was, there was one other woman who raced on one other night and I was the only one in all of my series, in all the series that ran the night I did who raced. But now there's way more people, um, way more women involved. It's really being a snowball effect. Um, and there is a place for you. So I would say just do it. Don't let, don't let yourself like second guess yourself. Also realize like you're just there to learn. Like nobody's there to judge you or to be like, oh, they didn't do this corner perfectly, you know, like people are just there to help you and, um, and just know that you still have value to bring and you deserve to be there just as much as anyone else is there. Um, and then depending on how far you're wanting to go in motorsports, I would say this to anyone is just be humble, ask questions, be teachable, but then also, um, like know your worth as well. I feel like that was something I used to undersell myself all the time and like, really kind of be like, oh, yeah, like, I guess I'm okay. Um, even though like I was performing well and everything. So mm -hmm. still like have the confidence to go after those opportunities. Like don't sell yourself so short that you don't try things. Obviously like still be humble, work hard, but, but go for things is what I would suggest. That's awesome. That's, that's really mm -hmm. good advice. Um, so what, uh, what's next for Erica Hoffman? Like what, what yeah. are you progressing to? Mm -hmm. So the goal would be, uh, last year I raced in Europe, which was super cool, but I'd love to race more in North America. So I'm trying and transitioning back to being more based out of Canada. My goal would be to race in Canada and the States next year, continue doing GT4 would be the hope, um, for next season. So working on putting together sponsorship, marketing, all those things. I think I've learned so much this past year, as much as racing is what we're all passionate about and you want to be behind the wheel. It's a thin wedge of the pie. Um, a lot of it is marketing sponsorship, getting connected with the right people and really realizing how you can be an asset to anybody who decides to sponsor you. So it's not just like, Hey, like give me money. It's like, okay, if somebody's sponsoring me, 
I am now working for them to achieve a goal. What are their goals? How are we marketing? How are we helping that company? All those kind of things. So that definitely takes a lot of time mm -hmm. um, versus just like, oh yeah, I got sponsored and it's cool. It's it's a it's a another job you're taking on. Um, so working towards developing proper sponsorship and having that in place for next season and then racing racing on this side of the pond. That's sick. That's mm -hmm. super cool. Um, if there was a sponsor, like your dream sponsor or dream organization Ooh. that you would want to kind of like to work with. Um, I think there are a lot. Honestly, okay, I'm going to say a few things. Number one, if I could do anything like stunt driving wise or like video production or something with driving on that side of the thing, I'd love to do something with Singer Porsche would be like my ultimate dream. That would be dream. cool. Because yeah. those have been like my favorite cars for years and years mm -hmm. and they're just the most beautiful things ever. Um, and then in terms of more commercial sponsors, um, I again, I love photography and stuff. So if you could work with a photography company or like... I shoot Fuji film, so if like you know they would want to yeah. do something or like GoPro, anything kind of actiony, I love. Mm. Um, and then in terms of just like straight out motorsport sponsors, let me think for a second because I don't want to like perjure myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's fair. Like it's it, it's interesting that like you see these companies that are not motorsports driven having a part in the sport. Mm -hmm. Like did you see at like Fuji film, like they were. Mm -hmm. um, they have sponsored a few cars and mm. and and do race teams in the past. Mm. Canon has as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Canon was part of like F one like back in the yeah, day. Yeah, I so remember much that this time. But yeah, no, I remember seeing old photos and stuff of that. So like those yeah. kind of things. Working with like even just like sunglasses brands or different yeah, things like, like that. Yeah. Like I'm like they're just so cool and like mm -hmm. fun to be able to bring in those other aspects because I find that obviously you love like um the motor oil companies that are like the background of motor backbone of motorsport sponsorship and everything but mm -hmm. it's also cool to see motorsport become a lot more mainstream and see other things that i like like how the companies represents themselves like what they do like what their morals are outside of racing and then being able to pair it with what i'm doing and being yeah. able to continue on those messaging mm -hmm. i think that's something that i'm looking for a lot more in the future of which companies i want to get involved with and really endorse is like okay can i actually stand behind how this company is presenting themselves and what they're doing and can i really like be an authentic ambassador for them because the company doesn't want you to like rep them if you're kind of like oh, i don't really agree with what you're doing yeah um and also i would not want to do that personally so really finding companies that you align with and that you're like yeah i i love the products i love what they're doing i uh like how they're supporting women within motorsport and within sports so i want to help like showcase them yeah no that's that's it's it that is important like believing in the brand that that's supporting mm -hmm. you um because like if you're if you're fake in that realm like it's it's not like it's just gonna be like, oh, that person's fake, but you can really tell that like yeah. this person's kind of forcing it, and it's not really part of their like, kind of lifestyle and whatever. Yeah, and I think it's hard enough in to be on camera and to like be likable and all this stuff. And there's all the like people give you feedback on how you come off on camera, and they're like, you need to be so much more energetic yeah. or this or that, and you're like, yeah. well, I don't want to be like a fake person, or it's gonna be yeah. awkward or all this. So if you're trying to say words or endorse something that you don't really believe in, it's just gonna be so awkward and gross, and everyone's gonna be like, mm, that was cringy. Yeah, that's that's honestly that is kind of something that I struggle with. Mm -hmm. I try to get in front of the camera more often because I enjoy it; it's fun. But then when I watch myself back. I'm like, I need to be more crazy, but like, I don't need to be more crazy on camera yeah. or like more energetic because mm -hmm. this is, I'm just a very like chill person and mm -hmm. it's different than what other people do. Yeah. I don't know. And I think you just need to be authentically you. Like yeah. also not everyone wants to see someone being crazy on camera. Sure. Yeah. There are certain people who are drawn to that and that's who they'll watch, but we all know other people who are like, oh, this is too much. This is obnoxious. So just like be yeah. yourself and somebody will that's, resonate uh, with it. It's true. That's that's very true. And um I guess the same thing to go with uh like the marketing aspect of mm -hmm. motorsports. Like try not to be someone you're not. Mm -hmm. Like be the person you are because most of the times if that that company or that team wants to represent you or you be represented by you because of who you are, not because of what you can or what you're trying to be. 
you, mm-hmm. if, that, yeah. if that makes sense. Exactly. And it's way too exhausting if you're trying to just put on a persona. And I would say this in terms of not just on camera, but also when you're just networking with people. I feel like you, like personally, I don't want to be used by other people. I don't want other people being fake to me just to use me to get to a means of an end or whatever. And mm-hmm. so you don't want to be presenting that to other people either. Like so many people are like networking in the name of the game, but yes, but authentically networking, like actually meeting people for the sake of meeting people and having a good relationship yeah. and not just like, what can you do for me? Because mm-hmm. people can spot that from a mile off. And also yeah. like, that wouldn't feel good. Like I want to have genuine relationships in my life. Mm-hmm. And if I, if people choose to support me, I want to know that they actually believe in me. We have a connection. They want to support me. I want to support what they're doing. We're going to have a partnership moving forward yeah. versus I like yeah. somehow hoodwinked them with like a fancy speech and I wasn't authentically <laughs> me and I was just trying to get something out of them. Then that's empty. It's not respectful to them and it's also not respectful to yourself it doesn't create any meaningful connection yourself so Mm -hmm. i would say that's another thing when you're networking or trying to grow in the sport or trying to create partners is you're not just trying to be flashy and and put up this fake version of yourself and laugh at every single joke so you get the the buck at the end of the day like obviously yes you want to be respectful and like put a good foot forward and everything but you want to connect with people for the sake of connecting with them as people versus just what can they do for me you know and it it's so true so um like this year we're still finalizing some of it um and i'm sure this it'll all be finalized by the time this episode goes out but we're putting some cash and a little bit of uh of like a package together for a younger female driver yeah that's so um, awesome by the it's way. It, i never really thought about it until like a couple of months ago i'm like you know what she's she's talented she's very fast mm-hmm. we went karting with her and she was like miles ahead i'm like holy <laughs> shit like Let's how go. is this how yes. is this possible um but she's she's such a nice person mm-hmm. she's such a quick driver and she's just always learning mm-hmm. and uh and then before i kind of I went and I emailed her and her mom and her, the team owner. I talked to a couple of people like, okay, cool. What do you think about this person? Like, is she, is she just like, is she a genuine person? Because mm-hmm. you know how some people could put the, the, the mask on just be yeah. a person. And she's very genuine. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the thing. Like, she is who she, say she says she is. Mm-hmm. So that's why we're kind of putting that that little package together to help boost and it's not like a big package it's not, mm-hmm. i wish i could give like ten thousand dollars to like you know here's all the entry fees for the season yeah uh but it's just something small and something to start with and um and then if more smaller companies do that mm-hmm. it could really really push the sport bring yeah. the younger generation up into mm-hmm. the sport um also it's, it's kind of generous you know like yeah. i myself i would love to be a professional driver mm-hmm. don't think it's ever possible um just like funding wise it's imp- it's it's hard mm-hmm. uh, but if you could do it to help someone else to maybe push their dreams then why not yeah you know it's it's something that's um it, it's it's a sport that just if you give maybe something will come out don't do it for that reason like don't don't like think that you're gonna get something out of it but but do it with i guess i i'm very karmic you know mm-hmm. do good things good things happen yeah so if it if it happens and she gets farther in life maybe i could keep supporting her career and maybe i could then film some cool documentary yeah. for her or something. I don't know. No, it's sick. You know, like it just kind of mm. push each other here and there. And yeah. like, like this podcast, like I'm not doing it for any particular reason, but I know you have some really cool stories and I want to share them. Yeah. And, and I appreciate and do that. It. Yeah. And like, it's so cool to see you get behind young talent and like that makes such a difference to a young driver. Also, even just mentally to know someone like saw something in you and wants to support you in that way versus just like, obviously it's also important to just give encouragement and, you know, follow on social media those kind of things but to actually like put something behind them really Mm -hmm. like mentally helps somebody develop and really have that belief in that like oh wow like they believe in me that's another push forward that's another striving for excellence and like being able to be part of that story and you never know where it can lead and how you can shape someone's career Mm -hmm. and like it's it's all about confidence with motorsports at the end of the day i've had times where i'm driving on the track and I just like a pop, like a just an idea pops in my head that I, that was weird that would happen like a month ago, and it just it throws off my entire lap time. Mm-hmm. My entire lap just goes to goes to crap. So just like little little pushes and confidence, and just like mm-hmm. little keys to like help someone get better is just uh, mm-hmm. it, it's a nice little nugget of, of gift. 
Yeah. A nugget of, I don't know. Even and like those <laughs> nuggets of gifts <laughs> add up. Um, and you never know when like that little bit actually really pushes someone over the finish line and helps. And um, I think that's the other thing within motorsport, but you could relate this to anything in life. Like you never know what's coming around the corner. You never know when that break is happening. So you're always working hard. You're always trying to put everything together to put together your season and your funding and these kind of things. Um, and it can be easy to be discouraged or to be like, ah, I guess it's not happening, but you never know what can come right around the corner. And even the, all those little things add up, like it's not a little thing. It, it really does make a difference. Um, and so I would encourage anybody who is pursuing motorsports to not give up, find a good balance that is sustainable on how much you can work towards it or work toward any goal that you're doing. Um, but I find that there are seasons you can get discouraged and be like, things aren't happening. Mm -hmm. So find that balance where you can still maintain it. It's not like obviously exhausting you and like making, like you're not working 24 hours a day and can't do anything. But, um, you, like, you never know who's going to say yes, what door you're going to knock on next. And it's going to go, it's going to open up for you. So yeah. It could be Aston Martin, could be Mercedes. Who knows? Yeah, that nuts. would be great. Yeah. So, where can people follow you? How do people get in touch? How can uh, future potential sponsors maybe Ooh. talk with Erica? Yeah. So my handle is pretty much Erica dot drives. So that's Erica with a K dot drives on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. I don't have a bunch going on on YouTube yet, but that will come. Um, nice. Cool. But yeah, so you can connect with me there. I also have a website, EricaHoffman.com. Um, two F's and two N's in Hoffman, very German <laughs> spelling. And, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, two F's and two N's in Hoffman. And yeah, those are the ways that you can connect with me. And I'd love to reach out or for you to reach out and hear more about your story and everything. Yeah. So if you have any uh, motorsport stories or automotive mm -hmm. stories that you want to share, or if you're just a member within the car culture and you have a passion for other things, like say you're, uh, I don't know, a pilot who restores old cars like let's chat it'll That'd be, be so cool to yeah. talk yeah um so follow us at the at the greasy fits and the flat tire podcast on instagram and facebook and um we'll hope to chat then